from everything that happens on board. And as we're all traveling about 250 miles above the Earth's surface, we are conducting experiments that can only be done in reduced gravity. We are learning to live in a closed environment space that's very closely controlled and monitored. And we're working on projects for us to go into deep space as well as immediate use here on Earth. And all of these brave astronauts, who, by the way, are from many different countries around the world, they've been doing all this important work for the past 22 years. Which means that men and women have been living and working every day in space for over two decades, making this international project we're working on absolutely real. And not some science fiction space station in some galaxy far, far away. Now, speaking of work, earlier today I was over at our medical lab working on some better experimentation. Because trying to grow cells outside the human body here on Earth is quite difficult because of gravity. These cells grow slowly, then we grow in two dimensions, and eventually they're crushed by their own weight. So we don't get as long as we want to study them. But in microgravity, that's a different story. Because those type cells, they grow larger, they grow faster, they live longer, and they grow three dimensions. Which helps scientists better understand life on a cellular level. This has been a major medical breakthrough that we share with other scientists here on Earth. Now, some cure diseases, to better understand genetics, and help improve organ transplantation. But of course, working with cells is not the only thing we do. We do all sorts of experimentation and research. This includes working with plants, animals, insects, fire, even working with alloys or trying to blend two metals together. Because trying to mix a very large industrial amount of lead and tin on Earth is nearly impossible. Because lead is so much denser than tin. So in the mixture, lead sticks to the bottom and the tin blows on top, like you see here. In microgravity though, these two metals blend together easily. So for the alloys, we know it's solder. That we use in the electronic parts for all of your phones and computers. So as y'all can see, we're really busy up here. But you know what? It's actually time for my favorite part of my day. In fact, it's the most important part of my day, and that's lunch. And I'm so glad you're all here with me today because it means I don't have to do extra work while I'm eating. So I'll go ahead and close this laptop up. There we go. All right, let's talk about the food that I have to eat in space. I'll start with a simple question. What do y'all love to eat? What's your favorite food? Bagels. What was that? Bagels. Ooh, sounds delicious. What else? Burgers. Burgers. What else? Do y'all like rice, pasta, soup, <laughs> salads, eggs? Anybody like ice cream? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, astronauts love ice cream. Get it specially made. What about tacos? Who loves tacos? Yeah, can't go away without them. And actually, just over a year ago, the astronauts finished growing the very first set of hatch shelly peppers in space. Then they make tacos with them. I heard they're spicy. <laughs> now these are our really great examples of foods that astronauts do actually get to eat in space, and that's because they have a wide range of food and beverages to choose from. So let's see what I got here today. I got some, ooh, mashed potatoes. Ooh, that's tasty, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I know it looks weird. But that's because we have to make sure our food is as light as physically possible, so it's easy to get up here. And this thing has to have a very long shelf life, because mostly we just got a pantry for all the food. Now there's a refrigerator on board the space station for food and drinks, but it's about this big, which is not enough room to hold all the food we need. Especially since we're up here for about six months at a time. So what we did was dehydrate almost every day. We simply took out the water. That means when it's finally time to eat your favorite dish, you grab your food pouch and then you bring it back here to the food rehydration unit which is where we put all the hot or the cold water back into the food, depending on the label. And then you just wait for that food to absorb that water. For mashed potatoes, it is 100 milliliters of hot water, then I wait five to 10 minutes. Then I just cut it over with a pair of scissors and dig in. What up with <laughs> Now, you also may be noticing over here on the table, I have nothing on that thing. No plates, no cup. Does anybody here know why? Yeah. Well, actually, we do want the water fully absorbed. Yes. Exactly. Everything on the space station is floating. It's because we're dealing with microgravity. Gravity looks so minuscule, our bodies don't notice or feel it, but we get to measure it. So instead of laying out a table like y'all do at home, we just had to melt for it every day. 
and I can take my food with me wherever I want to go by simply attaching it to my uniform. Or I can bring it back here and I can attach it to the wall. And now I know exactly where my food is when I'm ready to come back and finish. Now, if any of you are curious to try some dehydrated dishes when you get back to Earth, there are some available in the Space Shader today. And I know it's not the way that y'all make it at home, but I promise it's not so bad. Just remember to add cold water to the ice cream. So thank you so much for joining me for lunch today. Y'all have been great. All right, now, um, here's a confession. At the end of every single meal, huh, I go to the restroom. So please just give me a moment. Uh-oh. Um, it looks like somebody's removed the privacy curtain from this journey, so uh, I'll just wait till later. Yeah. Okay, trying to actually use the restroom or the way tight in compartment space is very different than trying to go to the restroom on Earth where y'all got water and gravity and flush everything away, right? Yeah, we don't have any of that on the space station. Instead, we have to use the power of suction, like the vacuum cleaners. That means the first thing you do you come over to the wayside gym compartment and you turn it on. Then, go ahead and lift this lid. And this weird thing right here, that's where you're going to sit for your solid waist. And yes, it's a very small seat with a very small hole in it. So y'all need to develop very good aim. <laughs> when you actually do hit the target, your solid waist will then be sucked away to a storage unit. And once that unit is completely filled, we'll just get rid of the whole thing. By jettisoning the space station from watching it burn up in the atmosphere. Which means that the next time you think you see a shooting star, <laughs> it might not be a shooting star. <laughs> now, liquid waste is a little different because it goes into this handy dandy hose. Again, you unscrew it and it uses suction. But all of this goes into a different system. And do you, any of y'all know what happens to all this liquid waste? Recycle. Yep. Because water is so scarce in space, that means we do actually have to purify, reuse, or recycle any and all water. Which means that the water y'all use before you make your coffee, that's the same water y'all used two weeks ago to make your coffee. <laughs> Talk about recycled juice. But remember, this is vital, essential for helping humans get further and deeper into space than we've ever gone before. And we're using all the technology right now here on Earth that brings fresh water to air in a polluted region. So this thing is actually saving lives. Lives. It doesn't taste so bad. <laughs> Here's a trick. It's not gross if you don't think about it. Now, trying to actually use water in space is also very different on Earth. If any of you guys build a drink right now, it would simply drink to the ground with its gravity. Oh, but please don't smell like drink. But when you're in space, watch what happens. All the water flows around because of the lack of gravity. Therefore, surface tension is the strongest force acting upon this water. That's why it looks like it's in those balls. It'll ooze around, bumping into each other, only making bigger blobs of water. And if it lands on anything with any absorbency to it, like that towel, wicking actually causes all this water to be sucked up like a sponge. Pretty cool, right? Yeah. So, let's take this one step further. Because the human body is made of about 60% water, it too is affected by microgravity. While you are in space, the fluids in your body is moving upwards, out of your arms or your legs, going all the way up to your head. This isn't making your head feel bigger or puffier. You feel like you've got a cold or really bad allergies, for the first 48 hours due to the congestion. During this time though, your arms and your legs are actually getting thinner and smaller, which is what astronauts call as chicken legs. It's not the only thing that happens to the human body. Gravity's no longer pulling you down, so your spine sits upwards of two inches, making you taller, which I love. But your heart gets smaller from lack of use, so it's not all good news. And you're losing bone density and muscle mass for every bone that you're up in space. But don't worry. It's all temporary. Once y'all get back on Earth, it all returns back to normal slowly but surely. Takes about one day back for every day in space. This is why it is so important for astronauts to be in good physical condition for every mission. And they gotta stay in shape throughout. So they're coming over here to exercise an average of two hours a day. Every single day. Do you think I could do that? Yes, not maybe so. Saturdays and Sundays and holidays included? 
<laughs> yeah, I'm not going to share it again. And don't worry, folks, I'm not going to exercise right now for the next two hours. But I'll show you how the dual cycle ergometer works, which is really a fancy set of words for a space bike. What you do, you sit down on it. Make sure your feet are on the pedals and you're holding up the handles the whole time. Then just start exercising, which looks really easy, right? Like your bike's at home, at the gym. Except the difference between those and this one is that on the space station, there's not enough gravity to keep me in my seat. And since we're not strapped to it, I actually have to use all the muscles in my arms, my core, my legs to stay seated. So this thing is actually a full body workout. And we also have treadmills here on YouTube, too, but this time you actually have to get strapped down to this thing or else you're going to go floating away while trying to run. I have another image of this one with NASA astronauts and Dina Williams right up there on the wall above your head. <laughs> and finally we have also the ARED, which is the Advanced Resistive Exercise Device. This is a very fancy system that uses resistive technology to help imitate lifting weights. Because we can't take weights to the space station. What happens? Exactly. So we have to get really creative to help us maintain muscle mass and tone. So as y'all can see, we're really busy up here. We're so busy, in fact, we have to add three new permanent residences on board. Their names are Honey, Bumpo, and Queen. And if you think their names are silly, it's because they're not human. They're the Astro B robots. Do y'all want to meet one? Okay, let's see then. Come on up, Bumble. This is Bumble. Hey, hi. Our Astro Bees are 12 and a half inches long and they float around in microgravity because they have fans up and move around the station. Bumble here has six cameras, one touch screen, and a perching arm. So you're going to help out the astronauts. We added them in 2018. Some have been taking on very small routine tasks, like taking inventory of items so astronauts don't have to. Now we're still working on our artificial intelligence. Hopefully one day they'll do even more. Until then, they're controlled by an astronaut or they're operated by somebody here on Earth. And last summer, Bubble here did a scavenger hunt that was programmed by students. Now we're still learning about all their use from it, but we believe having more robot recital, helping us get further and deeper into space than ever before. Hi, Bubble. All right, we've reached the end of a very long day. And astronauts are fully scheduled for eight and a half hours of sleeping every single night, from 9.30 p.m. to 6 a.m. Greenwich Mean Time. <laughs> and do y'all think I can stick to that sleeping schedule? No. Yes, no, maybe so? For those of you who don't think so, you'll figure it out. Because astronauts want as much sleep as they can get since they're so busy. The thing is, though, you got some challenges. One of them's the fact that the ISS is moving at 17,500 miles per hour, which breaks down to about five miles per second. That means this whole station that is about a, the size of a football field is going around the world once every 90 minutes, every hour and a half. While we are on board, you're staying up to 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets every single day, which is a lot of light. And that messes with the circadian rhythm, the internal clock, the human body. Plus, you're still dealing with microgravity. There's not enough gravity on board the space station to lay down comfortably like you are sitting down right now. Or else they're not just going to go floating off around and bumping into, well, everything, which is very dangerous. So instead, you can come over here to get into the SRU, the Sleeper Straight Unit, which is a cross between the sleeping bag and the straight jacket. <laughs> How it works is you unzip it, climb in. There are holes for you to stick your arms out of if you choose right here. So most of us actually wanted to stay in, stay nice, tucked in, and feel safe. So you just zip yourself up and strap yourself down. And you even get a restraint for your head. So you're nice, secure, and comfortable to this pillow all night long. Trust me, I got the end of thing too. So do you think I can sleep here on the wall? Okay, what about the ceiling? Anyone who said yes, you got it right. Because of microgravity, there is no up or down. You're already floating up here. So it's all dependent upon what you're physically looking at as to what is up and what is down. Which means everyone here can actually sleep here on the wall. And I'll go ahead and sleep on the ceiling. And then we'll switch every few nights. Build up the thing. Ashraf also have some of the same sleeping issues as the rest of us. Sometimes they just cannot sleep. Sometimes they have nightmares. Sometimes they have to use the restroom during the middle of the night. But remember, the SRU is tight because they're going to get to another. And the weight tight compartment. That thing is just 
difficult and awkward to use. So a very good rule of thumb is just try to go to the restroom before you get stuck there for the night. <laughs> okay? Our brave astronaut too has been living and working in space these past 22 years. They're getting a different view of the world unlike anything else. When they're looking outside their window, they're seeing a world without borders. They're seeing a beautiful blue orb floating in the vastness and the void of space. They're learning about all of their differences aside to then come together for a common goal. When they get back to Earth, they talk about all of these new perspectives and this great appreciation for our for, for our present planet. With all of the experimentations we're doing in microgravity to our advanced robotics for better data collection, we're putting it all to use to help out everyone on Earth and pushing us into our next deep space exploration to our new gateway space station around the moon, where the Earth's missions, then to Mars and beyond. Please leave me in the stairs and then have an out of this world day here at Space Center Houston!